I'm working at updating the McLaren's book beside the Bonnie Briar Bush. I mean to put it on the site along with the scarlet letter. Hopefully I I won't hurt it uh, too much. It's too good a book uh, not to be read. It's about life in a close-knit Scottish community, well away from the big, noisy world. And it's filled with truth and courage and stories of moral heroism. For example, there's one story involving farmer Drumshew, uh, that has Isaiah 53 written all over it. The word got around that Margaret Hughes' boy, Jordy, was the right caliber to be accepted in the college. Truth is, he was brilliant. And the whole of Drum Tocti Glen. Uh, felt that they'd been honored in having this kid, you see. To have one of their own uh, going to college was a simply wondrous affair. And his brothers and sisters would live on parsnip soup and raw porridge so that the money saved could be uh, put to college expenses. There was no way for outsiders to know just how deeply the drum talky people felt about such things. And that made it all the more astonishing that the miserly farmer drums here would refuse to contribute to the expenses, as he refused to contribute to many other appeals. It was no surprise then that the people started to ignore him and even to speak openly against him as a miserable skin flint. This broke Margaret's heart because she had known Drum Shew for a very long time and this was nothing like the man uh, she had known. She and her mother had lived on his farm when he was kinder and more generous of heart but that was before she met William Hugh and married him and it was before she and William began to reel stagger from one financial calamity to another in any case the whole Glen knew that Drums Hugh a farmer with more assets and potential than most of the others. The whole Glen knew that Drumshe was tight with his money. Even his closest friend, Dr. McClure, was forced to admit that he was fond of a bargain and hard to get money out of. When people look for notes money notes. Drumhue was changing his into pennies so that he could put a penny in the collection. He almost found a way to explain why he shouldn't contribute to whatever was in need of help. So the heads nodded and the tongues wagged any time his name came up in conversation. Well, Things took a fine turn for Margaret and her family. Her name was Margaret, but they didn't call her Margaret. It was Margaret. Um, A fine turn uh, came for Margaret and her family. A distant cousin of her husband's had gone to New York and really made good. And in Edinburgh, 
solicitor had been instructed to send money to William on a regular basis, and now and then he got an extra sum. Well, what a blessing. When pleurisy wiped out Hugh's cattle, they were able to set up again. And when they were to lose their land because they couldn't meet the bills, money from America saved the day. It meant that books young George needed to prepare for his conquest of college and the academic world. They could be got as and when they were needed. But then the young man became ill. A lingering illness that finally took his life. It was at that time that the crabby, miserable drumshew showed some traces of the old kindness and warmth. He visited the boy, spoke tenderly to him, wrote him a book every now and then, one he had ordered from London, and he listened with interest and pride as the youngster would explain to him all that was in the books. And at that time he began to speak to Margaret in warmer tones and in gentler ways. She never forgot these things. So her mis- so his miserly uh, was grieved her beyond measure. Drumshoe sent for McClure one day, insisting that the doctor come by to see him because he had something he had to get off his heart, something he had been bearing alone for about 30 years. Well, the two friends sat in silence in front of the fire, sat so long that the doctor began to think that the farmer couldn't bring the matter up. The doctor assured him if he had done anything wrong, he could speak it to him, and that would be the end of that. Trump's Hugh finally asked his friend to tell him what the clan thought of him, and he pressed the doctor. McClure conceded that they thought him tight-fisted. And Drum wanted to know what his friend thought. Ah. The doctor said he knew Drum wasn't greedy because he knew of times when Drum Sue had helped those in need. But he had supposed that his friend had been badly hurt in some way and buried himself in hard business to keep his mind off his sorrow. Finally, Drum Sue told his friend that he would have said nothing about the matter at all but that he had to clear his name with the two people who meant most to him, the doctor and Margaret Hugh. To Margaret now, he wouldn't be able to say a word. He just had to have his friend know that he wasn't a miser. I take it he presumed then that his friend would finally tell Margaret. Drumshew said that he had lived poorer than any plowman for the best part of his life, and that apart from the stock on his farm, he wasn't worth 200 pounds. It was for somebody else he had gathered, and as fast as he had gathered, he gave it away. He said, It was for love's sake that I haggled and schemed 
and starved and toil till I've been a byword at church and market for miserliness. I did it all and bore it all for my love. And for my love, I would have done ten times more. The doctor suddenly knew who Drums Hugh was talking about. It was Margaret Hugh. It wasn't just her winsome face and her beauty that had drawn Drums Hugh to her when he first met her. It was much more than that. He said, No man could say a rough word or have an ill thought in her presence. She made you better just to hear her speak and to stand beside her at the work. So there it was. In all the three years that she and her mother lived on his land, Drumshoe had adored her and hoped to win her. But he spoke never a word. Once their hands had touched when she had picked up a forget-me-not. She never knew it, but he had kept the flower for more than thirty years. Then, one lovely summer evening, up by the stile, near the hawthorn tree. She told him that she was leaving the house and going to marry William, whom uh, she had known as a child and who had been very good to her dead father. When she told him that, Trump's shoe was shattered. But he said never a word. When she was gone, he leaned over the stile for two long hours, and he felt that with the going down of the sun, the light had gone out of his life forever. Still, Trumshu loved her more with the passing years, and when the troubles came to her and to her family, he arranged with the solicitor to have money sent from William Hughes' cousin. Ah. And there were times when he had to borrow money to do what he did for her and for those she loved. His friend, deeply moved by Trump Hughes, Trump Hughes' hurt and sadness, said with a voice full of pride, You carried yourself like a man, though. You've had a sore battle, Trump, and no man to say, Well done. When the doctor left, Drumshoe opened his desk and took out a withered flower. Twice he put it to his lips, and each time murmured, Margaret, with a sob that shook him. It was a week later that Margaret Hugh came by to check on the old doctor and to thank him for his kindness during the last days of Geordie's illness. And in the process, she told him of Drum, Drum Hugh's frequent visits to Geordie his refusal to come in the house and the tender attention he gave to Geordie. It was then she remarked how strange it was that Drum's hue had become hard and stingy. There had been two Drum's hues, she said, and she preferred the one Geordie knew. The doctor told her that down all the years Drum had been pinching and scraping for someone else and never said a word about it. She
she went by to see him on her way home, and she arrived just as Drumshew was coming across the field to his house. He looked old and tired, but he was thrilled to see her, and invited her in for a cup of tea. And it was while he was upstairs cleaning himself up that she saw it. There was a picture of Drumshew's mother on the wall over the fireplace, and as she rose to look at it, something else caught her eye. A letter with the solicitor's address on it. Her heart stood still, and immediately she put most of it all together. There was no rich cousin. There was no money from America. There was only drums here. There was only the silent, penny-pinching drums here, carrying the whole burden and being castigated as a miser for doing it in gracious, loving silence. When he came back downstairs, she confronted him, and he finally confessed that the money had all come from him. The magnitude of it all overwhelmed her. Why would he bear such a burden for so long, especially when they weren't even blood-related? She gently put her hand on his arm, asking him to make sense of it. But when he lifted his eyes and said, Margaret, she knew. The red flowed all over her face and faded again. The eyes filled with tears that finally brimmed over and spilled down her cheeks and in a quiet sweet voice she said I never dreamed of this and I'm no worthy of such love I have had much blessing and you've had only pain Immediately, he told her. Immediately. You're wrong, Margaret. You're wrong. For the joy has risen over the pain. And I've had the greater gain. Love roused me to the work. Love saved me from greed of silver. And a hard heart. Love kept me clean in thought and deed. For it was always Margaret by day and night. If I'm a man today, you did it. Though you might never have known it. It's that I did for you. But you've done everything for me. I love you, Margaret. Precious Lord Jesus, for whom we have done so little, and who for our sake became poor, that we might become rich, you have won our hearts by your grace. How good it was of you. How good it was of you to give so much. To bear so much for us when we least understood. And how fine it was of you to scorn the shame that was heaped on you. How gracious you are for not ceaselessly casting up to us what it has cost you 
that we might be delivered from a poverty and a darkness that would have held us always. And to know that you have done it for love of us. To know that you thought it more than painful, but but that you thought it a joy, and that that joy was reward enough for you. To know all that only deepens our sense of the wonder of your goodness. To believe that you came joyfully, not in a grim and grudging way, to pay our debts and lift us from despair. That charms us and makes us your friends and servants forever.